and having commenced the sitting, it's questions now time for the questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. And I call Jerry Kelly. Minister. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Two cases of uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza, HPAI, HN. M8 were confirmed on commercial poultry holdings in Northern Ireland in January 2020. The first case in Clough, County Antrim, was confirmed by the Chief Veterinary Officer on the 6th of January. The second case near Lisburn was confirmed on the 11th of January. Disease control zones were imposed around both premises to limit the spread of disease, the movement of poultry and captive birds, carcasses, eggs, uh, used poultry litter and manure were restricted and required licences to be moved into or out of the zones. My department worked closely with industry and following the successful completion of disease control activities and surveillance within the zones, these restrictions have now been lifted. These notifiable avian disease outbreaks in poultry are the first in Northern Ireland since 1998 and are the first ever involving a highly pathogenic strain of the virus. A further 16 Suspect cases of notifiable avian influenza have been reported in Northern Ireland since the 4th of January. Suspect premises were restricted whilst a veterinary investigation was conducted at each site. Following the testing at the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, all these suspected cases were negated. Since October 2020, there have been eight positive cases of HPAI H5N8 confirmed in wild birds in Northern Ireland across six different uh, locations. Uh, the risk of a no notifiable avian influenza incursion into poultry flocks in Northern Ireland is still at the highest it has ever been. The avian influenza prevention zone will remain in place until this risk reduces. Veterinary officials will keep these conditions under regular review in collaboration with industry stakeholders. The need for excellent biosecurity to prevent further incursions will continue to be highlighted by my department as a crucial way to protect the national flock. Thank you. And Jerry Kelly, supplementary. Thank the Minister for his uh, um, answer up to now. In terms of what he uh, was reporting, uh, there it looks like things don't come in once in terms of the seriousness of this. I just want to ask the Minister in terms of the number of, I think you mentioned October there, the number of uh, cases going back to October and in different species, and uh, um, I understand across Ireland. And what level of uh, cooperation is there uh, in place at the moment to try and contain uh, this and, uh, and, sort of the, the, and contain the situation uh, in north-south uh, north -south terms? Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think it is important. Obviously, we're we're on um, this, the same island, and, and I think that cooperation is very important in relation to uh, this issue. And I know it certainly was the case as I brought through the executive a few weeks ago. Um, the requirement to notify whenever cases of COVID-19 uh, were found in animals that's become a notifiable disease. And at that time, um, it was my understanding that there is a process actually in place uh, where if suspected cases um, are um, uh, discovered uh, in either jurisdiction, there is a, there is a procedure in place so that uh, authorities north and south of the border uh, are able to work together um, so that we can do all that we can to stop the spread um, any further and to make sure that authorities both uh, north and south are aware and I'm sure that a similar process uh, is in place for this issue. Um, obviously we um, want to make sure that this sector is strong uh, and it remains strong and I think that it is important that we have those, those procedures in place uh, so that we can deal with those issues uh, when they arise but of course uh, we hope that they won't. William Humphrey. Minister, you mentioned risk in your response uh, to the first question. Can I just ask, with the spring now hopefully having sprung uh, and birds migrating on a much larger scale, do we run the risk of those migratory birds perhaps bringing this from other jurisdictions and are extra measures being put in place to deal with that issue? Uh, well, 
obviously at different at different times of the of the year um, there will be different implications and uh, he's absolutely right to, to mention the, the movements of birds because it is it is actually suspected that it's wild birds um, that, that that are the cause of the outbreak uh, in in this case um, it's it's the most rational uh, explanation uh, so of course it's um, absolutely the case that we need to uh, do everything that we can uh, to stop that from happening and taking into consideration the time of the year um, and, and and how birds uh, move move about. Um, additionally, though, we will take other measures uh, to try and make sure that we prevent um, outbreaks like this uh, taking place. Uh, as I've said previously, this is a, a notifiable disease, and um, immediately then the disease control zones were put uh, in place around the infected uh, premises. And we also are, as a department, engaging with stakeholders uh, to make them informed, uh, keep them informed of the uh, developments and trying to amplify that message of enhanced uh, biosecurity in order to keep those birds safe. Question four has been withdrawn and I call Jonathan Buckley. Question number two. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and, and first of all, I'd just like to say that it's very much the case that the past year has presented uh, many difficulties for the agriculture industry. And I am pleased that uh, my department has been able to provide some financial support to offset the losses caused by market disturbance across a number of sectors impacted by COVID-19. To date, the Agricultural Commodities Coronavirus Income Support Scheme Northern Ireland 2020 has made payments of almost £19.2 million to approximately 11,300 businesses in the beef, dairy, uh, sheep and potato sectors, and work is ongoing to assess and process remaining claims from about 20 applicants. My department has also uh, announced financial support worth £4.2 million for the pig and poultry sectors. £2.2 million has been allocated to pig producers who were impacted when Cranswick Cranswick uh, Country Foods were, uh, was temporarily closed for two weeks at the end of August, and £2 million has been allocated to poultry producers that were specifically affected by the downturn in the market for hatching eggs. New legislation will be required to enable my department to make payments to both pig and poultry farmers, and I plan to bring this to the Assembly in the coming days to enable the schemes to open and farmers to receive uh, their payments by the end of March. Jonathan Buckley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I place on record my thanks to the Minister for his work since he took up post in supporting those within our farming community, and indeed also his predecessor, who quite rightly focused and prioritised COVID-19 support for those farmers that have been impacted by COVID-19. Minister, you, you did elaborate in some way on this point. Perhaps you could go further on updating us on whether you have given consideration to supporting the reduction in price received for cull size as a result of COVID-19? Uh, well, first of all, can um, I echo uh, his comments, um, not just about the job that I've been doing, um, but the, the job that uh, Minister Putz uh, had done. What we have as a result of that work um, is the most extensive uh, support for agriculture anywhere in, um, in the UK or, or Ireland. I think that is to be welcomed, and I think that it, it shows uh, the commitment we have to agriculture here in Northern Ireland and that we recognise its importance and that we do everything that we can to support um, our agricultural industry. Minister Putz and his officials uh, have been meeting with industry stakeholders on a regular basis and have uh, met with representatives from the pig sectors to discuss their concerns uh, regarding cull side prices. And my uh, officials are continuing uh, to monitor the impact of COVID-19 on the market and are reviewing evidence uh, to determine the level of loss uh, incurred. Uh, however, there are other factors impacting this market, and I will, of course, consider the issue carefully. I call Patrick McLoan. Aaron, or Patrick McLoan. Uh, I, uh, uh, I thank the Minister for his responses. Could, could I ask the Minister, in relation to covert support for uh, Loch Ness fishermen, um, we have had numerous updates to the committee. Uh, the most recent one was, in fact, that it had been cleared by the DSO, and the Department of Finance had also been consulted and had come back to give it the green light. So, can I ask the Minister for an update as to when those payments will approve, be approved? Because there, it seems to be an interminable time since they were first mooted by the Department. 
Yeah, um, I think that um, this is a, an issue of, of, of concern and, and I understand what the member is saying in regards to the length of time and um, certainly I hope that that can be progressed as soon as possible. I don't have definitive time scale for him now. I recognise the work that he and many others have, have done on this and I do recognise the, the importance of it and uh, as soon as we can uh, provide that information, we of course will. Call Colin Gillernoy. And I thank the Minister. Um, and Minister, I appreciate that you have given some information in relation to this, in relation to pigs and poultry. And I welcome that, uh, that indeed, in given the concentration of those sectors within the South Tyrone area. But can you outline, as well as the financial um, envelope, can you outline any additional information about the scheme? And can you also touch upon the organic milk producers, whether they are being included in some of these hardship funds? For me? Yes, um, absolutely, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and I, uh, this is an issue, in, in particular the organic milk scheme that I have been um, uh, involved in, and I, I recognise the issues um, that are there uh, with that and the uh, differential loss that has been suffered and the, and the need to, to provide support uh, for that. And uh, I hope that an announcement on that um, will be able to be made um, very soon in, in terms of getting that support where it's needed. I call John Blair. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister what considerations have been given to, to providing the Northern Ireland wool producers with urgent financial assistance as they too have seen fallen revenue as a result of COVID-19 and will continue to see the effects of the um, COVID-19 pandemic as we move towards recovery? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I am aware of the impact um, that COVID-19 has had on the global market uh, for wool. Um, although I am pleased to, to hear that wool markets have reopened and that local wool from um, the 2019 and 2020 clip is being marketed, albeit at a much uh, reduced market uh, price. Uh, on February the 15th, I met with representatives of Ulster Wool, British Wool, UFU <coughs> and the National Sheep Association for an update. Um, on the impact that COVID-19 has had on, on global wool markets and the consequences for local sheep farmers and Ulster wool. And representatives of British wool detailed um, the figures that they had on the financial impact that COVID-19 has had. And uh, these figures are now being submitted uh, to my department uh, in writing and are being carefully considered. Um, with markets for, for lamb remaining strong this year, throughout the summer and autumn, the reduced wool price will have a relatively small impact on the total profitability. Um, but uh, in the, uh, we, we want to help where we can, and in, in the longer term, uh, I intend to work closely with stakeholders from the uh, sheep industry and Ulster wool, um, as he's mentioned, um, about recovery, and to see what we can do um, and develop a strategy for sustainable uh, wool uh, productions. And a number of meetings have already taken place uh, with my officials and Invest NI, and uh, also industry stakeholders mm -hmm. um, who use wool as part of their, their business to discuss options for a long-term strategy uh, to increase uh, wool uh, utilisation. Call Rosemary Barton. Minister, thank you for your answers so far. Minister, as you will be aware, the agricultural shows which have been used in the past to showcase much of our good agricultural produce here in Northern Ireland had to be cancelled last year and therefore had not the opportunity of collecting gate receipts that would be used to pay various running expenses during, during this present year and during last year. Uh, Minister, I'm wondering, would you have uh, discussions with members of the Agricultural Show Society with a view to perhaps support and giving them some financial support? <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I'm more than happy to, to have those meetings and to have those uh, conversations. And I agree with the member. Um, our agricultural shows uh, are really important, not just for the agricultural community, but for the wider rural community as a, as a whole. And, and I'm sure um, many uh, urban dwellers are, are also have also experienced um, a, a, and enjoy what, what our agricultural shows have to offer. I fully recognise the difficulties that were caused as a result of COVID uh, last year, and unfortunately, that's now also impacting upon their ability to plan for this year uh, as well. That's a real concern uh, for me. And um, if we can look at ways in which we can offer our, our support as a department, I'm more than happy to do that. And if a meeting would help um, uh, in order to facilitate that, of course, I'll, 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 find, I'll find time for it. I call William Humphrey. Number three. 
Mr. Speaker, responsibility for dealing with illegal dumping is shared between the local councils, who deal with low-level waste offences, and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, who deal with large-scale waste criminality and hazardous waste. For large-scale serious and or organised waste offending, my officials continue to work locally and nationally with a range of law enforcement agencies, departments and district councils to gather evidence, detect offenders and, where possible, report such criminality to the Public Prosecution Service. My officials are also continuing to develop interagency working with regard to the fly tipping protocol, which is in the process of being agreed with local councils. And this will facilitate quick and efficient responses to smaller cases of reported illegal dumping. It will consolidate responsibilities both for NIEA and councils and will maximise the effectiveness um, of uh, our collaborative efforts in dealing with illegal dumping. Throughout the last year, my department has been proactive in delivering a multimedia communication strategy aimed at combating illegal dumping and fly tipping and littering. This was delivered via radio, social media and a flyer delivered to 800,000 households in Northern Ireland. And this has led to increased awareness of the impact of illegal dumping amongst the general public, generating more reports for my officers to investigate and more opportunities to target offenders. William Humphrey, supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, you will be aware that dumping across Northern Ireland is now happening on an industrial scale and, and widely across our country. Last year there was dumping on an industrial scale in the Crumlin Road at uh, Eden Area Industrial Estate. This led to uh, my having to contact the Environment Agency and Belfast City Council. Information from the Environment Agency was slow. The, re the response in terms of information was nil. Belfast City Council were slow, hugely frustrating for the people living beside having to deal with rats, uh, uh, flies, all sorts of noxious smells. Can the Minister assure me and uh, this House and the people of Northern Ireland that he is working more collaboratively with Belt local government, particularly in, in this city of Belfast, for those of us who represent this city, to ensure that this, this issue is addressed once and for all across government, both regional and local? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for raising the issue because this is something that impacts um, so much on the people that, that we represent. And, um, in, in recent days and weeks, I have had a, a number of complaints uh, in relation to, to issues. And it is not just the fact that illegal dumping is unsightly, it is all of the other issues that come, come with it as well. And it is right that we do all that we can uh, to target that. And my officials have been working closely um, with district councils to, to progress powers uh, for both um, the Environment Agency and Council uh, officials. And the agreed position is that NIEA is responsible for the investigation of large-scale waste criminality and the removal of hazardous wastes, for example asbestos, and other fly-tipped waste over 20 um, cubic metres in volume. And district councils take responsibility for other deposits under uh, 20 metres cubed, what might be more commonly understood as, as fly tipping, uh, a casual dumping of household waste by individuals. But while it is the case that there are different responsibilities between councils and NIEA, I think it is absolutely right that there is collaboration uh, and working together, and it should never be a case uh, of simply passing the buck onwards, getting the job done so that we can deliver for the people we represent. Members of the House will agree that um, illegal dumping and waste is a scourge of the countryside, and I will uh, commend the council, but also local communities who have taken control of their roads and their byways and, without, and have been engaged in litter picking uh, great over the course, particularly over the course of the last year during the lockdown and the restrictions. The member will be uh, familiar that the issue of illegal waste and dumping it, it knows no borders, no boundaries. So I would just ask the question, has the Minister been engaged with his counterpart in the south of Ireland to, attack, to try and take measures to tackle this issue? Mr Speaker, well, the member will be aware I have only been in, in office for, for a short time, and I, I have not ha had that opportunity to, to engage on the particular uh, issue that, that, that he raises. But certainly, if there is a, a cross-border uh, element um, in regards to, to, to waste, I think it is important that the, that the authorities on both sides of the, of the border work together uh, to try and, uh, and deal with that issue. So, uh, although I have not had that uh, direct engagement, of course, it is absolutely the right thing that uh, it happens where necessary. I call Pat Kennedy. Thank you. Um, Minister, I was wondering what recent analysis uh, has your department done uh, of the materials being illegally dumped? 
um, in general, what analysis has been carried out of of, um, of, of Dumbling, I think, is the question that the uh, that the member has has raised. Um, that is not information that I have, unfortunately, here um, with me today, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, but of course, I would be more than happy to see what, if any, analysis that the department has uh, carried out in terms of the, 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 the types of waste, or perhaps uh, or where it originated from. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have further detail from the member. Um, but if he does have a more specific query he, he wants to bring to the attention of my department, I'm more than happy to, to look at that and furnish in any information uh, that we have. Call Alan Chambers. Uh, Minister, there has been a substantial amount of illegal dumping in the countryside since lockdown, and frequently, if the owner of the land can't be identified, there is often an issue between the councils and the environmental agency as to who should be responsible for its removal, to such an extent that the illegal dumping is never removed. Now, I know you have alluded uh, earlier in an answer there that uh, there should be no buck passing, but in such cases, who does the final responsibility actually lie with? Well, um, Mr. Speaker, as I have already outlined, it will depend upon the type and nature um, of, of, of the waste that is, is there and of the nature of the dumping uh, that has occurred. And I think it is so frustrating um, for um, individuals and for us as elected representatives as well. And I think this is why he's raising it whenever we have examples in our own constituency. And there can be at times seem to be a disagreement of who's actually uh, responsible and who needs to, to come forward uh, and deal with it. And I hope that we can get that clarification that people do take responsibility uh, in their own areas. Of course, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, the most important thing is, is that the people who are actually doing this take responsibility. And uh, where we're able to find out who has dumped this, uh, who, who has um, been practicing um, the, uh, and, and partaking in this illegal behaviour, um, that they uh, are, are punished in the way that they should. And um, he'll be aware that the um, legislation that currently uh, exists has provisions for fines of up to £50,000 and a term of imprisonment not exceeding six months. And uh, I think it's uh, re very, very important that the responsibility first and foremost lies um, with, with the people who are involved in dumping when they shouldn't be. Can we please bring Paula Bradshaw into the spotlight? Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number five, please. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my officials have been working with DEFRA, other devolved administrations, and the Science Foundation Ireland to inform development of a Northern Ireland programme for uh, SARS CoV 2 coronavirus uh, surveillance in wastewater. In November 2020, DERA agreed uh, to to uh, co-fund a research uh, project to uh, establish um, this uh, wastewater surveillance and reporting. In Northern Ireland, a team at Queen's University Belfast is leading this work with collaborative partners in University College Dublin. They commenced their research in December 2020 with an initial scope of work that included sampling two wastewater treatment sites in Northern Ireland with plans to extend to a further six sites. That's eight sites in total. DERA agreed a funding extension of the initial research grant award in January, which will enable the capability being established through the programme uh, to process a greater number of samples in the coming months. And DERA officials are engaging with counterparts in the Department for Health, the Public Health Agency and the Department for Infrastructure uh, to develop an effective cross-departmental approach to long-term wastewater surveillance. Paula Bradshaw, supplementary. Um, thank you very much, Minister, um, and that's very, very helpful. I'm just wondering, um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that Queen's and my um, constituency are involved in this and that there is going to be cross-departmental working. I'm just wondering, um, to what degree will the public be made aware of any of the findings of this um, research? Thank you. Um, well, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the member will, will be aware that we are still at the uh, early stages um, of this research so far. Um, we don't have any of the um, we don't have data to share yet, or the results of any of this. Um, however, I think if we're to uh, publicise the, uh, the the research that, that we have done, it's, it's right that that's made uh, available to the to the general public so they can see the benefits uh, of doing this. Perhaps she's referring specifically to to those that are affected. Um, 
whenever this is actually uh, rolled out. Uh, and of course, it's right that if, if um, this work is being done and if issues are detected, the whole point will be to tell the local public so that they can, can take um, precautions uh, as and when is necessary. I call Roy Beggs. Uh, Minister, you've referred to the, the ongoing monitoring that is occurring. But my question is, has that activity and research uh, determined that there is a need for uh, additional protection for staff who may work in wastewater treatment works, or indeed uh, is there a need for additional treatment to uh, protect the public, public against any risks that may result as, uh, from that treatment? Well, Mr. Speaker, there's, there's no doubt that um, the staff that will be involved uh, in this will take all um, proper precautions, as, as they always will, uh, anyway, due to the nature of the work that they uh, would do. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, particular impact on the on the public or extra treatment that might need to be uh, carried out. If, if there is, I'm more than happy uh, to furnish uh, the member uh, with that. Um, however, I think it is right that we highlight the the importance of this. It is in innovative, and uh, I think it's really positive to see this uh, collaboration um, as, as we try to do more to deal with this pandemic. Nicole Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question six. Mr Speaker, my department fully funds the companion animal welfare service delivered by local councils. $1.25 million has been allocated to the delivery of this service for the period April 20 to March 2021. As part of its service, councils take forward a range of actions to address animal welfare concerns in companion animals. For example, they provide advice, issue improvement notices, take animals in need into their possession, and initiate prosecutions where appropriate. Supplementary, Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much for your answers, uh, uh, Minister. But uh, my office, office has been contacted by a number of constituents in connection with uh, puppy smuggling. Can I ask what steps is the minister taking to tackle uh, puppy smuggling? It's an increasing problem across Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the member for raising the issue? And it's uh, one that I have also noticed an increase in the number of people that are getting in contact with me about it, and it is a, a growing um, issue of, of concern. And my department has established a multi-agency forum with representatives from local councils, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, Harbour Police and departmental portal staff. The forum aims to ensure that the illegal breeding and movement of dogs and pups is addressed on a more joined-up basis. The Police Service of Northern Ireland is actively investigating individuals involved in illegal movements and has been involved in reactive seizures of animals. My department is also raising awareness of the matter through its online presence. Messaging includes general advice on how to spot an illegal puppy farm, putting a stop to illegal puppy farming, and who to contact on suspicion of a puppy farm. Call Rachel Woods. Mr. Speaker and Mr. Bradley must have seen my questions on puppy smuggling there, but in terms of the multi-agency forum and the aims, what engagement is there um, to stop illegal puppy uh, smuggling cross-border, given that we don't have Lucy's law in place in Northern Ireland? Well, um, Mr. Speaker, I, I think someone said uh, behind me that Robin Newton is bringing that uh, in, and uh, I'm committed uh, uh, to ensuring the welfare of pet animals in Northern Ireland um, that it remains protected, and this includes uh, pups and kittens. And uh, I'm aware of the changes to legislation in England, uh, which now means that pups and kittens cannot be sold to third-party uh, details. And uh, I believe there is considerable merit in having similar protections for, for pups and kittens being sold uh, in uh, Northern Ireland uh, as well, and I'll support legislation uh, on that issue. That ends the period for a list of questions. We now move on to topical questions uh, for 15 minutes. And I call Robbie Butler. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, I have written to you and a number of other uh, elected representatives in the Lagan Valley area have also raised this issue with you so with regard to the smells emanating from Mulliglass uh, landfill site. Can you give us an update as to the work that the Environment Agency and the owner of the site have undertaken to eliminate the smell? <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, Mr Speaker, and, and, and first of all, can I just 
um, recognise the huge concern uh, that there are in the wider uh, West Belfast, Lisburn area in relation to this. Not only have I uh, got um, people getting in contact with me via the department, but uh, a number uh, to my own constituency office and um, online in, in, in different ways uh, as well. So I, I do recognise just how important an issue uh, that this is, and I'm aware of the large number uh, of, of um, representations that uh, elected representatives such as Mr uh, Butler uh, have made. I know there are a number of potential odour sources in the area, including Mulliglass Landfill, um, which is regulated by NIEA, and there may be other sources. And NIEA have been working with the local council environmental health officers to investigate residents' complaints, and in undertaking a number of odour checks, have confirmed the continuing presen presence of odours in the area surrounding uh, Mulliglass landfill site. I have instructed NIEA staff to work with the local councils to increase their efforts to ensure that all regulated sites have in place all necessary measures to reduce the off-site odours which are impacting the wider community. Robbie Butler, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I'm thinking in the, the wider context of landfill sites, uh, not just Mullow Glass but other landfill sites, uh, in terms of environmental impact, what is being done to uh, protect our environment and modernise how we deal with our waste and, and, and such a nature? Uh, well, of course. Um, Mr. Speaker, it's a priority for us to uh, ensure that we um, move away as much as is possible from putting uh, our waste into landfill. We want to see that uh, increase in uh, recycling, um, which I think we've done a very good job in over the uh, last number of, of years here in Northern Ireland. We're doing really well uh, when it comes to our recycling uh, take-up. Uh, but I think that we also need to look at um, different technologies that uh, can come online. Um, that can, can deal with this uh, issue. Um, so we need to take a, a holistic approach uh, to it all, and I think that that's very important. Keith Archibald. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his responses so far. And Minister, your instruction to DERA officials last Friday is in terms of the ministerial code, both cross-cutting and controversial. Do you therefore accept that only the executive can take that decision? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I've, I've received advice uh, on this issue, and certainly um, uh, there is the opinion um, uh, that issues that are cross-cutting uh, in this way um, that, that the member has, 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 has described uh, should come to, to the executive. Uh, it was my opinion that DERA had been given the responsibility uh, for this. However, uh, I know that others take a, a different view. However, if it is the case, um, that issues relating to the protocol uh, need to come uh, to the executive. Um, there will be a lot of other things then um, that, before my department carries them out, will have to go uh, to the executive, and that will require uh, the support of the executive if they are to proceed. Supplementary, Keith Archibald. Um, I thank the minister for his response. Um, minister, you have said that you are putting a halt to the construction of facilities. These were contracts awarded by your department. Are you seriously now interfering in contracts and procurement to score political points? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's interesting that in all of the questions um, that I have received from members on the other side of the House, they've never even pre um, prefaced their, their, their comments with any concern uh, about the people of Northern Ireland. They have never expressed any concern about the damage that the protocol is having on people in Northern Ireland. They have never even acknowledged um, concerns uh, that there may be uh, issues in getting goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. They don't acknowledge uh, that we do far more trade uh, with Great Britain uh, than we do uh, with anywhere uh, else. And it is absolutely um, my concern. Uh, also, that public money uh, is being spell, spent uh, properly, and I think it's entirely uh, appropriate um, that, as discussions are ongoing with the Joint Committee, and uh, as a result of the uncertainty that is out there uh, in front of us, um, that uh, we uh, are not uh, racing ahead um, in a way that would be considered uh, unreasonable and inappropriate. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, answers so far. Would the Minister outline if he is supportive of garden centres reopening in a safe and an appropriate way, given the health benefits that there are to the general public of working in their garden 
and indeed, Mr. Speaker, to the uh, need for the businesses to be open at this time, given they have a very limited window of business act activity. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I do agree with the member, and, and for a number of reasons, I think that we, we can look across um, to. Uh, other uh, parts of the of the UK and garden centres are, are are completely open, and I think that even to open garden centres on a click and collect basis uh, would have been um, good. Um, it, it supports businesses that obviously need to have um, the uh, plants and other materials sold because of the of, of, of planting season and, and, and the nature that we that we find ourselves in uh, at the minute. Um, I think that. These um, places are, are normally in open spaces where um, people can space out as, as they queue um, to uh, pick up whatever they have, have ordered uh, online or by, uh, by, by telephone. And I think that while we have a stay at home message, it's entirely appropriate that we try and help people to stay at home as much as possible. And that can be uh, via uh, making sure that they can be out in their gardens and enjoying their gardens. So, so for all of those reasons, yes, I would agree that um, we should be we, we should find a way uh, to allow them to be open. Supplementary, Robin Newton. Mr. Speaker, and thank the minister for that answer. Uh, minister, you will recognise, indeed, I think it's well established that working in the garden can indeed make very positive contribution to the health of individuals, the mental health in particular. Could I ask the Minister if you have discussed this matter with the Minister for Health? Uh, Mr Speaker, the Minister for the Economy brought a paper to the Executive and um, had, in, had included uh, the possibility of opening uh, garden centres. Um, the Executive did not agree to open them on a, on a click and collect uh, basis. I had argued at that um, uh, time um, that I thought it would have been uh, appropriate uh, for uh, garden centres to, to open, not only because of the uh, impacts that it could have on the businesses themselves, um, but also the health and mental health um, of, uh, of all of our constituents. Subsequently, I have also um, put that in writing to the Minister for Health to outline the reasons why uh, I believe um, that it should be allowed. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I take very uh, seriously our, our responsibilities as an executive to deal with the with the pandemic uh, and to try and keep the R number under one. Um, but it is our responsibility and our duty to look at these issues as a whole, to look at the impact on uh, COVID, on health, on mental health, on businesses and the economy, and taking all those things in the round. I think that it would be appropriate to allow click and collect uh, for that, and I'll continue to advocate for it. Liz Kimmins. Corla, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. I find it interesting that, that the Minister and his colleagues are now interested in the impact of the people on the, of the North um, when they weren't so interested when they are pushing through a hard Brexit. Minister, it's my understanding that there has been no changes to the arrangements at the port since last Friday. Can you confirm that? Um, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, it, it is the case that the uh, work that is ongoing, the, the checks um, in regard to the protocol, uh, continue. Supplementary, Liz Kimmins. Can the Minister therefore confirm then if your decision was based on advice from departmental officials? M Mr Speaker, whenever I made the decision uh, last week, uh, I based it on uh, a number of, of factors that uh, came to me from within uh, the department. And, uh, I hope the members had the opportunity to, uh, uh, to listen to the explanation that I gave in the Assembly here uh, yesterday. Um, there are a number of reasons uh, why um, I took the decision that, that, that I took. One, of course, was um, the responsibilities that I have under Section 46 of the Internal Market Bill, which requires me to have a special regard for Northern Ireland's place within the uh, UK internal market, Northern Ireland's place within the customs union, and Northern Ireland's um, uh, the, the free flow of trade uh, between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. There, in addition to that, there are legal uncertainties, and uh, in addition to that, there are practical barriers to some of the things that we might be expected uh, uh, to do. Uh, so, taking all of that evidence and all of that into account, uh, that's why I took the decision that I did. I call Trevor Clark. Mr. Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister, in terms of his predecessor, who was in the office in the month of January, what, uh, there was a meeting with some retailers. Can the Minister outline what risks was identified at that meeting? Uh, I thank the member for, for, for raising uh, this question. And, um, 
I, I think it is important that we highlight what was actually said uh, at that meeting, and I know the, the minutes of that uh, are uh, now public. Um, but there were a number of concerns uh, that were expressed. Um, uh, if rules don't change in regards to EHCs, there were concerns regarding uh, food service, hospitality, disruption to supply to schools, hospitals uh, and prisons, issues raised about um, uh, the uh, official control regulations, the need for clarity at the end of the easement period, otherwise there will be a sudden and rapid reduction in range, and also uh, a difficulty to see how frozen and fresh food can comply. That's what took place, uh, and that's what was said to Minister Putz at that meeting. He then accurately reflected uh, what was in um, that, uh, what was in those those minutes. And other parties then came out and accused him of scaremongering uh, and scaremongering on uh, steroids. They were clearly uh, wrong, and I think that they owe uh, Minister Putz an apology. Ever Clark, supplementary. And I think, uh, I suppose, maybe in your, your answer, you've answered what I wanted you to say in the sense that, because given as you have highlighted the ministers, or sorry, the members opposite, and indeed forms of the media criticised Minister Pitts. So we'll go beyond the members in the House. Would you actually even call them indeed the media? Should apologise for some of the commentary around Minister Pitts', Pitts assertions at that time? Well, yes, absolutely. I think uh, everybody that was calling into question the accuracy of his, his, his comments need to reflect on the fact that that has now been refuted. Uh, very clearly, and um, I think it would be uh, appropriate uh, for people to recognise um, the accuracy of what it was that Minister Putz uh, had said um, at that time. Of course, for a lot of people out there, they don't want to recognise that there are going to be issues. A lot of people want to put their heads in the sand and think that a simple tinkering um, with the protocol will, is all that is needed. We do face fundamental questions. Um, we do have fundamental concerns and challenges, and we need to wake up to those. Call Joanne Bundy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question follows on. Um, we all know the saying, there are none so blind as those who will not see. And I think that that's certainly applicable to some of the warnings that have been issued over the protocol. Um, and about goods in our internal market. So on that basis, could I ask the Minister if he would spell out the full implications for Northern Ireland of rigorous imp implementation of the protocol? Uh, I apologise to the member because I have only two minutes to answer uh, that question, and it wouldn't be possible for me in that time um, to express the impact that it's going to have on Northern Ireland. Uh, wh wh where, where should I start? Perhaps the red tape? Um, and the additional bureaucracy that it's going to cause. Perhaps I could mention the reduction in choice that there could be for consumers. Uh, perhaps I could touch on the issues that hauliers are going to have uh, and the issues that have already presented themselves and, and, and will only uh, get, wor get worse. We also have to take into consideration the, the barriers um, that are going to be placed within the UK internal market and all of the difficulties that are going to come uh, from that. We have to think of the businesses that are now going to um, not be able to trade um, or say that, they, that, that they, they don't feel they're going to be able to, to trade with Northern Ireland because of the extra cost uh, and complexity of that. Um, we also have restrictions on livestock uh, that can come in uh, and out of uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, what about well, guide dogs uh, as well? Um, uh, the difficulties bringing guide dogs in here uh, to, to be trained and the impact that that's going to have on our uh, citizens as well. And in addition uh, to that, we've also seen issues as well around the importation of machinery uh, into uh, Northern Ireland. So when you take all of these things uh, as a whole, these are only, uh, only a short uh, summary of some of the issues that we are facing, which is why it is so, so, so important that we get an alternative to the protocol, because no amount of tinkering with it is going to make it work. It needs to go. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for his answer. So, on that, in light of that, then, what discussions has he had with the DEFRA Minister to highlight and reinforce that this can't continue for Northern Ireland? Um, well, in my time in office, I've, I've had a number um, of uh, letters that I've sent to him outlining these concerns, and I actually had a, a phone call with the Secretary of State uh, last night, and I highlighted the impact that the protocol was having uh, on Northern Ireland and the impacts of. Um, uh, that, that the end of the grace periods will have, um, the horrendous situation that we will be in if the OCR charging uh, comes in. And I made the point to him, he represents a, a Cornish constituency, 
and I said to the Secretary of State, how would you feel if a border had been put in place uh, between uh, Cornwall and, and Devon or Cornwall and the rest of the UK? How would you feel about needing um, uh, common entry health certificates if you wanted to, to get produce uh, into Northern Ireland? How would you feel about the extra paperwork? How would you feel if um, delivery companies said they were not delivering uh, to Northern Ireland? Um, these are the issues and the concerns that people here in Northern Ireland are facing. We are part of the United Kingdom, and it's intolerable uh, that we are uh, facing these problems here, and it would be intolerable uh, for the Secretary of State as well. That's why action needs to be taken. And time is up, members. Thank you for that. Can members, please take a raise for a moment or two. You want to point of order? Point of order, Mr.